First of all, stand with your feet together and close your eyes. Keep your eyes closed for a moment. Open your eyes. Can you walk heel to toe like this? Good. Walk on tiptoes. Walk on your heels. That's lovely. Hold your arms out like this with your palms flat and close your eyes. Keep your hands where they are. Keep those fingers straight if you can. That's lovely. Let's keep still like that for a moment. And now with your eyes still closed, touch your nose with this fingertip and with this fingertip. Good. Open your eyes. Play the piano. Good. And tap your hand. Other hand. That's good. Now turn and face me and screw your eyes up tight. Lovely. Relax. And silly grin. Stick your tongue out. Wiggle it. That's lovely. Stare at my face. Point at the fingers which move. Now stare at my face. Let's point at the finger. Now that's it. Look at my face if you can bear it. Point at the fingers that move and stare at my finger. Now keep your head still and just follow the finger. Look at the finger. Follow that finger. That's lovely. Excellent. And now can you lie on the couch, please? OK, just going to tap your reflexes here. Can scratch your foot, you won't like this. And again, lovely, isn't it? And stare straight up at the ceiling, just going to look in the back of your eye here. Keep looking through my head. And look over there. Excellent, you passed with flying colours. <laughs> of course you need to understand the method behind all of this madness, which I shall now explain. Starting with Romberg's test, a very important test, we can all usually stand with our feet together and our eyes closed, but normals wobble a little bit more with their eyes closed. That's not abnormal. Some people are very anxious when doing Romberg's test and are all over the place. That can be non-organic, and you'll pick those patients up when you try and get them to do tandem gait. And having wobbled everywhere with Romberg's test, then when they do tandem gait, no problem at all, Look, even with my hands in my pockets and walking backwards. While in the Ministry of Silly Walks, the patient should be asked to walk on their heels and on their toes, which is a very quick and useful test of the power of dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. When looking for drift of the outstretched hands, ask the patient to stretch their hands out as far as they can and get the palms flat, fingers straight, as they're holding a tray from underneath. Once the patient's got the message, close their eyes, and in normals, the hands should stay in the same place. But if I've got a left hemisphere lesion, the right hand may do that. Or if I have neglect, it may fall away like this. But hopefully it will stay put. And with the patient still in that position, you can then test light touch by touching first, for example, their index finger and asking them to touch their nose, and then their middle finger. So you've tested light touch and the finger-nose test. Testing rapid tapping movements is a very useful screen for ataxia. And if you're concerned, you can make the patient do it in a more difficult way, like that. Most people are better with their dominant than with their non-dominant hand and the same applies to fine finger movements, a very useful test of pyramidal function. And while you're fiddling around with your hands, then move straight on to testing the visual fields. I do this with both eyes open and the patient staring at my face or at my nose, and you have to remind them to keep staring at your ugly face and to point at the fingers which move. I test one side, then the other, and then both together to check for inattention. The reason I think this is acceptable is because you hardly ever see people with an isolated nasal field defect. Important visual field defects always involve one or other temporal fields, and of course if there's an abnormality, then you'll want to go on to test in more detail, perhaps with a red pin. After that, one moves on to looking at the face, get the patient to screw their eyes up tight, check they can bury their eyelashes. When they open their eyes, check and see that the pupils come down nicely to light, and while you're looking at the eyes and pupils, have a quick squint to see if they have Horner's syndrome, which is most easily recognised by looking for the quizzically raised eyebrow, more wrinkles on that side, then you focus in and look and see if they've got a droopy eyelid. And of course the small pupil is much better seen in the half dark than in full light. Then onto the lower face, silly grin, should be nice and symmetrical, and rapid tongue movements. Tongue out, blah, 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 like that. Patients usually find that relatively entertaining, except for the ones with a pseudobarbital palsy, who, 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 tongue movement. It doesn't do what it's told. 
After that, it's onto the couch for the tendon reflexes and fundoscopy, about which you need no instruction, although if you feel unhappy about them, it's simply a matter of practice. While the patient's on the couch, of course you'll check the blood pressure, and in older people with headaches, you will probably want to screen for primary neoplasm, palpate the breasts, abdomen, examine the chest, and then you're done.